it's really great to like learn about how someone eats. It's kind of funny. I remember like, um, I think all of us try to say like it's easy. We try to sell it to people like it's easy. Like yeah. uh, Mike Dolce was saying on his uh, Instagram. We need to start rolling. Let's yeah. yeah, Mike Dolce was saying on his uh, Instagram that he is like barely on a diet. But then he was also talking about like Ezekiel bread and he was talking about like, you know, really watching his like fats, you know, but he doesn't feel like he's on a diet because he's on a whole foods diet. Right. So he has a lot of good options. But I was just thinking like there's people that they don't barely know what a carbohydrate is. They barely know that there's sugar in milk. Um, there's people have no idea how much fat they eat, how many calories like they just don't have any base. And so for those people. It would feel like a diet. It would feel very, very difficult if you just said, hey, you know what? All you got to do is just get rid of some of the processed foods. That's probably like 70 or 80% of their diet at the moment. So after today's video, I put a link down below for an infrared sauna blanket. A lot of people don't want to shell out the money for a sauna, and I don't blame them. They're gigantic. They're expensive. But an infrared sauna blanket is a way for you to utilize a sauna but in a very portable and convenient and inexpensive form. So that is a 15% off discount link for Bond Charges Infrared Sauna Blanket. If I am on the road, if I'm traveling, or if I'm just in my gym and I don't have a big sauna in my gym, then I will hop in that thing. I'll use it as a warm up. It makes it feel like my joints are ready to go, but I also break a sweat really quick. Infrared is different from a dry heat sauna. So you a lot of times sweat faster with an infrared because it's for lack of a better term, kind of heating you up from the inside out versus a sauna that you sit in, like a, a high heat sauna, heating you from the outside in. So this is really cool. You can adjust the heat, plus it's got all kinds of other features, but highly, highly portable and much more affordable than a giant barrel sauna. So use that code down below, Delauer15, for the Barn Charge sauna blanket. <laughs> do, you, do you think diet really means what people think it means though? I mean, like when you look at the word diet, Hmm. I think people's first connotation is sort of restrictive, right? But yeah. I, I don't see it that way. I see diet as, I mean, your diet can be processed foods. It's your diet, right? It's like, it's almost, there's some, there's a, there's a possessive nature of whatever <laughs> diet you're doing. My diet, your diet, this diet, that diet. It doesn't necessarily imply that it's a restrictive diet. So I, but do you think that we need more diets? Do you think? Do you think that it's productive? And this is a—it's not a loaded question, actually. I mean, do you think it's productive, or do you think it starts a, a negative cycle when there's different diets that people can do? I think we're in a really weird time. I think there's been a lot of like research, and there's been a lot of like studies over the years on diet and nutrition. And I think that uh, nutritional science is like the king of junk science. <laughs> it's almost like. It, it almost has taught us nothing, but it also has taught us everything. So it's an interesting thing because the only way that we would know that a whole foods diet is the best is not necessarily just to eat it, especially in the presence of these other foods. There's a lot of other foods that are convenient and easy to get to. And if our ancestors were here, you took somebody from some tribe and they don't have access to uh, the foods that we have access to. If they were here in America and they hung out with us for a little while, they might be eating pizza and <laughs> all the other crap that we're eating. But you really don't, it's hard, it's hard to really truly know that until you start to hear piled up data. And now we have a lot of piled up data to the point where we know that ultra processed foods are offensive. And our new, but we also know that dieting can be uh, something that's sort of dangerous for you. you, you uh, both of us have uh, you know, over fasted and um, you know, didn't have good electrolyte balance, you know, cramping up or having um, you know, restless nights of sleep and so on and doing things that you get so excited about it that you do the very thing that you're supposed to be doing for your health, but it's to the detriment of your health because it can also sometimes cause stress. So your diet needs, your nutrition needs to be nutritious. And that is exactly why I have this fork here at Thomas DeLauer <laughs> because I have brought for you, I'm trying to have you level your game up. I have brought for you Ooh. some, <laughs> I know it's I coming. packed it up a, a couple times here because Thomas and I were having a conversation about cod liver oil. And I was like, no, bro, I'm like actually eating cod liver. 
And so I brought you, oh, I actually packed a fork and a spoon already. I actually brought nice. you some cod liver, <laughs> and this will make a giant mess, but let's just try it anyway. Let's have you try it on the air here today. We'll crack this open. It's sitting in its own it's oil. Its own oil, yeah. But it's vitamin A, vitamin D. It's yeah, got, yeah, I mean, you've heard me talk so much. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge cod liver mm-hmm. oil fan. Sometimes I catch some for it. But. There we go. So this is just sitting in its own oil, and this is like the most nutrient slide, dense. Slide it over on the on the wrapper on the pack thing ever. It's uh, it's got like thirty grams of fat. Never before done on Thomas Delauer's podcast. No, this looks, kind of looks. Ooh, Dude, actually, you're gonna be shocked. It's actually well, I'll let it you. It kind of smells like cat food. Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> so Cod liver is like the greatest food ever. <laughs> I love it. No, it I'm tastes like it tastes like the the fatty end of uh, ribeye. You know, the like edible, that little mixed edible with, part. mixed with like a little anchovy taste, kind of. But yeah, you throw a little salt in there. Yeah, people that don't like fish are going to be like, "Dude, you guys are crazy." But anyone that even remotely likes a little bit of fatty fish, <laughs> you're like, "This is great." You're completely stunned. No, dude, that's legitimately incredible. Have you ever had it, Jar? Yeah, save some for me. Okay. Yeah, seafood. Well, anyways, you know, back to kind of my point is that, you know, your nutrition has to be nutritious. And we're hearing people try to fill in the blanks with uh, a lot of supplements and stuff like that. And I don't really think that's a great route either. I just think that we have to. I'm a fan of supplements. I like supplements. I take, you know, things like magnesium and zinc and like I get excited about some of the stuff and I have cabinets full of uh, not just supplements, but like vitamins, minerals. Um, I, I don't know. I hear something on a podcast. I hear, um, you know, this guy talking about this thing and this other guy talking about another thing. And I'm like, well, let me just try it. Let me just that sounds interesting. Let me try, let me try that out. But the answer kind of always comes back to the middle. And if we can just try to be rational, I think the first place when we think about like B vitamins or we think about vitamin A or vitamin D, what are the natural, how do we naturally get it? You know, how do, how do, can we get it from the sun? Can we get it from our food? And the answer is yes. So I think start to, you start to poke around with some of that and you start to get answers on how you should structure your diet. And once you start to kind of fill in the blanks on that, you end up with a full day of, of eating quite a bit of food to try to get the nutrients that you need if you're exercising, if you're lifting, and things like that. How much on a scale of one to 10 do you think calories matter? The calorie thing is, is a really interesting one. And uh, we have to define things better. You know, like a lot of times we say that something works or that we say that something doesn't work. Um, Working and like working forever are like two different things. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's never, you'll never find a diet that you're going to do for X amount of time and then discontinue the diet and go back to some sort of reckless behavior (laughs) that's ever going to really have a a great net benefit. You're going to have to at some point uh, be an adult (laughs) and uh, be more responsible for your nutritional behavior. You can't just do keto and then come off keto and be like, keto didn't work. You can't just count calories and then lose 15 pounds and then say, and then you come off of that for a little bit and you say it didn't work. You're like, well, when you were doing it, it looked like it was working. What do you mean it didn't work? Let's get into that more. So I, I actually think that, I actually think that if you're only looking at calories, I don't think that's uh, super effective. Obviously, um, you know, if you go to Lane Norton, you're talking about like literally if you weigh yourself on the scale, I, th- I don't know if this is his definition. It's probably the definition for being a caloric deficit. If you look at the scale and it's going downward, you are in a caloric deficit. If the scale is not going downward, <laughs> then you're not in a caloric deficit. So there's a lot of nuances in there because we have like this energy system. Some people use the energy super efficiently. Uh, some people uh, throw in a dollar and they get four quarters out. And some people throw in a dollar and they get 75 pennies. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Everyone's body is, has a different uh, efficiency, and that could be determined by a multitude of things. That could be your genetics, could be your mitochondria, it could be um, your pancreas. I mean, your pancreas might secrete more insulin, or your body might be more sensitive to insulin. I mean, the list of things can go on and on. Um, you could just simply have more muscle tissue than somebody else. 
So I always found the calorie thing to be a really interesting uh, equation. I think we do, I think it's helpful to have a measure of something, um, but is four calories of carbohydrates the same for Thomas DeLauer as it is for somebody who's 33% body fat? Mm-hmm. Is it the same? Maybe, maybe it's the same outside the body, but maybe it's in, once it's ingested by you and once it's ingested by this other person, uh, maybe the reaction to those calories is quite different. Maybe that person tends to store that energy a little bit more because their body doesn't know how to turn that into efficient energy. And maybe your body's like, hey, we worked out twice today. Like, let's just uh, have that go into repair and uh, uh, glycogen and things like that. Have you heard of the uh, constrained energy model? Go for it. <laughs> Tell me. It's, it's wild. I talked about this with Paul, too. Uh, and a lot of people, when they're here, oh, you talked to Paul about it, it's completely false. But it's not Paul's idea or theory. Like, this is a very flushed out theory mm. that is still theory, but is very backed up as well. It's the constrained energy model basically describes us as having like this set amount of energy that we will really expend in a given day. Mm. Uh, or a given time period, because I always say, like, body doesn't flip and know, <laughs> like, if it's midnight. You know, I mean, maybe it does, mm-hmm. circadian cues, whatever. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, X amount of calories in one day or X amount of calories over 47 hours. Like, right? Those I understand your point. Yeah. But the constrained energy model says, if we work out really, really hard this morning, our body might start to actually conserve <laughs> later in the day because our body is trying to protect and keep us within a certain range. So as a result, unbeknownst to us, happening unconsciously, we're actually burning less. I have actually, I want you to carry on with some of this because I want to learn more, but I have actually noticed this in myself. So if I do 10,000, maybe 12,000, 15,000 steps, good sweet spot. Start to do 20 and my body just doesn't seem to react the same. So it's not like I exponentially seem to lose more. And I know someone could say, well, you got to account for the calories in a very particular way. But I think it's uh, it draws a point to kind of what you're talking about there. Yeah, there's, there's absolutely a line of diminishing return. And I think that you can squeeze more out of it, but it's happening against the grain and very inefficiently. And mm-hmm. I've absolutely noticed this firsthand. And when I learned about this, I just learned about this six weeks ago, maybe. And like so much more makes sense. Because I guess I never really thought about how much of our caloric expenditure, our energy expenditure comes from non-exercise activity thermogenesis. I I knew it was big, but I just never really, I couldn't fathom how much of it it is. It's it's everything. Mm -hmm. It really, I mean, outside of our basal metabolic rate, of course, but that fluctuates so much with people. It's almost hard to even talk about it. Like someone that's obese and never worked out before and tell them, what's your BMR? What's your basal? I mean, they're going to look at you like you (laughs) <laughs> you know, you're from another planet. Right. But when you explain to them non-exercise activity thermogenesis, it clicks. People get mm-hmm. that. Oh, okay. Yeah, my walking through the parking lot to the grocery store, my doing the dishes, my little things. And I've experienced it as a runner where like we all know those elite, elite runners that will go out and run like 20 miles, but then they're couch potatoes the rest of the day. And it's not because they're lazy or anything like that. It's Things that a lot of runners don't have great physiques either. No, that's very true. But things that are almost out of their control. I mean, I say this out of their control because there is a like a, an unconscious pull mm. to conserve. And maybe there's a psychological play too. Like I ran 20 miles. I earned it. I'm just going to sit down the rest of the day. But all the way down to fidgeting and how much you move. I don't know if people realize that us sitting here, the difference between doing this, mm-hmm. drinking, moving things, and doing this and not moving at all. Right. I mean, we're talking 3x, 4x, 5x, you know, more above our BMR, right? So independent of BMR, it's like, am I going to burn 10 calories from NEAT or am I going to burn 100 by, you know, over the next two hours? But if we exhaust ourselves, then our body, unbeknownst to us, it just starts to say, hey, don't do that so much. But we would never know because it's an unconscious maneuver. So we're just we're we're moving quite a bit less. Mm-hmm. We're not fidgeting as much. We're maybe not going and doing the dishes when we might go do the dishes. Otherwise, these things are like, why don't I feel like doing the dishes? Well, there's a, like an unconscious pull saying, right. like, conserve, conserve, conserve to keep you in a specific range. On the contrary, if we go do the minimum effective dose and we say, let's go just train 
pretty hard for 30 minutes, but let's just kind of leave it at that. And then suddenly, without even thinking about it, you burn more calories throughout the rest of the day and stimulate more recovery because you're not beating yourself into the ground. So it's a really, it's mind blowing. And once you learn it, you almost can't unlearn it. It's like, like this is real. Maybe I don't need to be blasting myself into the ground. You're bringing up a crazy, interesting point because I mean, what if you were to give yourself, let's say, this magic number of 2,000 calories is like the sweet spot um, for somebody just to maintain their body weight, right? Um, but they take it to uh, 2,500 calories, and they're actually concerned that they're going to gain weight, but maybe their energy output increases. So uh, your metabolism, in my opinion, it is a is a moving target. And this is why, personally, I don't really love uh, dropping the calories. But when you talk about you know, the people that are going to say that it works, it works, it works, those are the people that are usually like getting on stage for something. They're usually like bodybuilders. They're usually fitness competitors. And they're people that are super diligent and they weigh their food and everything. So it's close to being in a test tube as you can get to being in a test tube. Yeah, and yeah. I don't know, like, I don't, I don't want to say like that's not good because you're doing too much work because that's not fair because somebody might not think it's too much work. Or they just enjoy it. Mm. They enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, they enjoy it. They want to be lean. They want to be in shape. They like the results they get. They don't mind weighing. It doesn't take extra time. They're used to the tracking. They're used to like either writing it down or using an app or whatever it is. And that might be a great strategy for them. But normally what we see is from what I've seen in helping a lot of people lose weight and even in helping myself to lose over 100 pounds, um, was that when I reduced the food that I consumed, I started to really reduce it too much. There was always blowback. Every single time there was always blowback. My body didn't want to respond to it. Now I'm not saying that my body, uh, because I wasn't eating enough, that my body was like holding on to fat. Um, I hear people uh, say things like that and. I'm not going to doubt that there could be potential for like you're so stressed that your body just is like in this weird funk and can't produce the energy that it needs. Um, but that's not really what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is what you were mentioning is like your motivation, like everything just starts to take a little bit of a nosedive. And if you think about your worst day, just think about when you wake up one day and you're like, whoa, something is wrong. Like you feel really, really sick. What are you going to do that day? You know, that day you're going to be like, oh, man, I I think I got to call into work. Oh, man, I don't think I can go do that basketball game that I was going to do tonight after work. Shit, I, don't, I can't go to my kid's baseball game. Like you start to everything starts to get like squashed down. And you're like, I, oh, my God, I can't do anything. I'm going to go from the bed to the couch to the couch to the bed. And that's what I'm going to do for the day. And obviously it doesn't happen to that same extent when you're like dieting, but you can put yourself into that position where it's just no more, no more, no more longer uh, enjoyable to go on a walk. It's, it's no longer enjoyable to go and do cardio or to go lift. And you're like, man, what is wrong with me? And I think in those moments, I think it's a good idea. I've been there a bunch of times before. It's a good idea to back your way out of that. Just say, you know what, for the next, I think, I think it might take a little bit of time. Like I'm not talking about two, three days. I'm talking about like two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. you give yourself like two or three weeks to just, you don't have to go hog wild. <laughs> you don't have to eat everything in sight because that will make you anxious probably too because you probably will gain some body fat and you won't be too pumped about that. But you do need to put everything on pause for a moment and probably restart. I would agree. And I feel like, I remember you told me a long time ago, probably like five, six years ago, Maybe not that long, maybe four or five years ago, you told me, we were talking about my testosterone levels and wasn't too happy with where they were. Mm -hmm. I was fasting a lot and I think I was just in a caloric deficit a lot and I was like in the high 200s or something. And uh, you told me, I was like, you know, you're like, Thomas, a lot of times what people just need to do when that happens is take a week off of training. Mm -hmm. Just like eat more, take a week off yeah. of training. And I didn't take a full week off of training. I lasted like three days. <laughs> right. But I did start eating more. And I remember, you know, pretty much like clockwork, I mean, my testosterone went up a good 75 points. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, okay, now that there's merit to this, you know, I, I can see how this works. And that's purely anecdotal. But I think that it's one thing after another, after another, after another. You know, you start, you cut down the calories a little bit. Maybe you cut down one particular macronutrient, or whatever. Then it's, I don't know, law of attrition. It's like this little, 
bit, a little bit, a little bit until it's a lot. Right? You know, you shaved off 2% of your workout performance today and you shaved off another 2% next week and another 2%. And then you're finally at, you're at 10, 15% drop mm-hmm. off in your workout performance. You start noticing it. And then you're like, well, I'm not working out as hard, so I need to eat a little less because I'm not expending as much. So I'm going to eat a little less. And then it's like another 1% drop in my right. performance. Well, shoot, I'm barely working out. I need to, I probably should just fast today. You see how it begins. And the next thing you know, the last thing to kind of go is just your drive in general. Next thing you know, you don't want to work out. Mm. You don't want to move, right? And digging yourself out of that is hard because it's not like, I don't think it's linear that you can just reverse your, reverse diet yourself out of that. It's almost like you need to, in some ways, you need to just say, I'm going to dedicate myself to eating unprocessed whole foods. I'm just mm-hmm. going to eat as much as I can comfortably, not gorging yourself, but being <laughs> unlimited eggs, unlimited chicken, unlimited steak. Just go, just go. Unlimited veggies, definitely unlimited veggies, unlimited fruits, and just see what happens. And it's kind of what I had to do just to like, that was my emergency break. Mm. When I was like realizing my motivation was down, my trade, my emergency break was actually to eat more. Whereas my old emergency break was to fast. Mm. I still like to fast, but that used to be my e-break. Like, oh, things are getting out of control. Fasting will reset it. No, now the reset is dive into good food. And it's amazing what happens. I, you know, you see a lot of people, again, do this when they're sick. You know, they just sleep. You know, it's yeah. like, it's like intuition. You're just like, I don't feel very good. I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything. I got chills. I'm just going to be wrapped up in a blanket. I'm just going to sleep. And so I think there needs to be times where you just allow yourself some sort of reprieve or some sort of rest. And you might find it in your calories. You might find it in eating more food. You might find it in uh, meditating. You might find it in relaxing. You're going to hear people, you know, over the next couple of years, probably talk a lot more about meditation, relaxation. Um, I don't know what the science says on stuff like this, but I do know that you know, even just like a good night of sleep, your metabolism can be so much different than if you only slept for like four hours. Mm-hmm. So imagine a scenario where you listen to Thomas DeLauer, you listen to Mark Bell, you're all fired up. You're like, okay, these guys are great. They talk about like eating a lot of protein and they talk about, um, you know, intermittent fasting can be a great strategy sometimes too. So I- I'm going to try that today. You know, and they, and they give it a go and they just maybe have some coffee in the morning, real minimal calories, almost next to nothing in the morning. And then, I don't know, 4 p.m. or something rolls around and <clears throat> they're getting home from uh, or 5 p.m. rolls around. They're getting home from work and they're just like in this like frenzy and they were stressed all day at work. They were they, they didn't give themselves an opportunity to sit down. They didn't take a shower. They didn't meditate. They didn't relax. I, I realize people are thinking like, man, I ain't got for nothing (laughs) you know like i don't have three minutes like sit down and chill but again using that scenario of how your sleep can have such a crazy impact on your metabolism and especially the metabolism of your carbohydrates what do you think that scenario is when you're eating in your kitchen when you're cooking your food when you're simultaneous simultaneously got the tv on as you're trying to catch up with your wife and your kids at the same time there's just there's a lot going on and i'm not saying that everything needs to be uh this like seance ritual and that you have to sit down you know with your crisscross applesauce and like you know have this great posture and like eat and stuff but I do think it's important to try to find a way to relax a little bit. Can you at least take a few minutes? Can you, when you get in your car, rather than turning anything on, rather than listening to the next podcast that's going to make you better, just drive in some silence and just work on some breathing. Just think about your day. Think about maybe a couple things that you're grateful for. Practice some uh, balancing of your mind. Practice some gratitude and just just try to just just calm down a little bit. Like, hey, today's over. That was pretty cool. You know, I got, you know, A, B, and C tomorrow, but now it's time to, like, rest and repair. And you're supposed to be in this uh, rest and relax kind of state, but you're really not. You're, like, somewhere in the middle. You're in this, like, gray area. And I don't think, um, and I've heard uh, John Wellborn and many other people talk about having, like, these crazy breakthroughs just by telling people to sit down, take a moment before they eat. Just close your eyes. You don't have to pray, but if that's your thing, you can do something like that. Or you can just think of a couple of things you're grateful for and chew your effing food. Yeah. Take a moment. Like, chew, like, you know what I mean? Like, sometimes I get home from work. I'm totally guilty of this. I'm like grabbing a bunch of stuff and I'm like, yeah. oh my God, I'm like a, I'm like a bear. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just like relax. 
Let me be grateful for the food that we that my family and I provided. Let me enjoy this. This is like a really amazing piece of meat that I have in front of me. Let me let me savor this thing rather than just like inhale it through a straw. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm guilty of that too, for sure. I mean, I chow down like madmen, I mean, <laughs> right. all the way from satiety signals to whatnot. That's not a good thing to do. <laughs> yeah, right. But I do think that our habits are very, very hard to kill. And if the habit is the stimulus response is this feels good, even if you consciously know that it's bad when you get home and you raid the pantry, I've been there too. I mean, it's just, it's it's almost impossible to override that until you have some kind of pattern interrupt. Something. It's so, it's so weird how um, like nothing's enough for us. Yeah. You know, you can't you can't just watch TV. You have to have your phone with you, and you can't just watch TV and have your phone with you. You also need food with you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like we're like really balancing a lot of different things. And I'm again, I'm not saying like that. I think you should kill these things all the time, but mm -hmm. it's good to be conscious of them and say ah. You don't have to really worry about it. Just say, all right, I'm taking my phone. Let me put it over here. I'm taking this. And I'm actually just going to concentrate on my food, shut the TV off, eat, <laughs> and yeah. then boom, TV. You're not really concentrating on it probably anyway. I would argue that most of us are sitting in the sympathetic nervous system almost all the time now. I mean, it's there's a product, and this is not a plug for them at all, but it's. Uh, have you heard of the shift wave? No, but that sounds great. Yeah, it's pretty wild. It's. Uh, I've only tried one on like demo, but like... People have sworn by him. I know that, uh, what's his name? Um, why am I drawing a blank? The uh, quarterback for the Rams, Matt uh, Stafford. Mm. He is, uh, he's a big fan of that. He uses them. My physical That's therapist great. that I use that'll come help me is Stafford's traveling physical therapist. Mm. And he was telling me that you know, he uses this thing. It's a device that you basically get in, you sit on it, and using some kind of electrical impedance, I don't really know how it works, it shifts you into a parasympathetic state. So it's it's like a $10,000 device. I'm like, all right, well, it's not something I'm just gonna go out and buy until I right. maybe try it a few more times. To see. But the anecdotal stories that people have talked about, like it just basically kicks you out of the sympathetic. Uh, it does it by just rearranging kind of your electrical system. Again, I don't really know how it works, but when you're talking about like professional athletes, mm -hmm. I mean, they are always on. Right, right. right. Like they travel, they get to the hotel, like their schedules are insane. They're always on. Their recovery systems are a lot of times being forced through pharmaceuticals too, just to like get them to like relax mm -hmm. or get them to be not in pain or get them to aid recovery. And I'm not talking about PEDs, I'm just talking about anti inflammatories and, right. and Mobic and crazy amounts of ibuprofen um, and just manipulating that recovery as much as they can to squeeze this performance out just before they break, right? But being able to turn that off. The difference between a professional athlete and someone that is maybe a corporate executive that's stressed out doing the same thing is a professional athlete has an off season, mm. right? So most people that are just in regular life, I think they're always on. And if you're always on, there's no way that you are in control. You're just not in control. Like you're not going to be able to make the right food choices. You're not going to, it's just not going to happen. I mean, you can force it. You can, I always say like prefrontal cortex your way through it a little bit, mm. but the amount of discipline that takes, I mean, there's only so much actual willpower that you have before you're just like, okay, I'm going to cave and not even realize that you cave. I think, you know, just to give people something tangible that they can do, um, just try it like once a day, just see if you can lay down on the ground for three minutes, put your feet up on the couch and just breathe. You know, I don't really care a ton about how you breathe. You can do some box breathing, four seconds out, four second hold, four seconds in, something like that. You can follow almost any protocol, but you just really need to just try to cal try to just calm down. Yeah. And if you think about it, like whether you're utilizing that for a food practice before you eat or you're just utilizing that period, um, it's like who who do we know that wouldn't benefit from pumping the brakes on on their day for, yep. for just a moment and even if you you know even if you have to do it you know as your lunch break or wherever you can just just give it a shot i used to think all these things are stupid too and, and i know that there's people listening and they're like bro you need to get back to calories you you've uh you jumped the shark like you need to get back to teaching people about protein leveraging and all these things they they do work um but we have to define work work for how long you know, you and I have been in this for a long time. I've been doing this since I was 12 years old. And to to see how your body reacts to it, 
it's not just a day to day thing. It goes in these it goes in these cycles, and uh, I kind of think the body works in at least just like a pattern that I know that I've noticed. I don't know why it. I don't know why my brain thinks this way, but um, three hours, three days, and three weeks. You, you're gonna, there's going to be some sort of signal to do something about your food probably about every three hours. Every three days, you're going to notice a response in your body from the foods that you've been eating. Three days, that's all it takes. Like if, especially if someone's really heavy, three days, they might have lost like six pounds. If they you know, never before had a dietary invention or intervention, they may lose a bunch of water weight in just a couple days. And then three weeks is going to be uh, where you start to really feel you, you start to feel what you did. And now, and now you could be, if, you, if what you did previously, in the previous three weeks, uh, was right, and it led you to this next thing that you're gonna go through, then you'll probably feel okay. And if, you, and if it wasn't, then you're probably gonna feel like shit. And you'll start to have a lag, and then as you know, and many people listening that have uh, really followed through with a diet or followed through with just fitness in general, that you don't get back out of that for just a day or two. Like it takes, it can take a while. So it can be really frustrating, it can be really annoying. There's no there's no really right way. And what I'm learning more and more and more, and it's, um, it's really an interesting concept, but I think you have to be your own expert. You have to be your own doctor. You have to be your own advocate because you're not an expert, I'm not an expert. We do know a lot about this stuff. But what I'm finding out more and more is the experts aren't experts. We only know what's available for now. And what's available for now gets shit on all the time. <laughs> and the only way to really science this stuff is to have a really open mind and to understand whatever science and data and information that we have now, it's going to continue to change. The only thing that might remain the same is being in tune with how you feel because how you feel changes how you feel changes quite a bit but most more than likely you're going to find the foods that feel right you're going to find the exercises that feel right and that is going to come and go a little bit as well so you have to get yourself in tune with that what have you found works for you when it comes down to fat loss now we've talked about this a little bit just offline right like if you say okay i need to lean out it's not just about saying, okay, well, I'll just reduce calories or I'll just do X, Y, Z, or I'll just leverage protein more here. Like, what have you found undeniably works for Mark? It's amazing. There's so many strategies. But I would say uh, there's two strategies that I have that I think have been really effective. One is I did a meal plan where I ate five or six meals every day, and I ate almost the same foods every day. That is not something that I could realistically repeat for any real length of time. I just did that for a bodybuilding show one time. Um, if I really felt like you know you and I are having a competition or something, or or we we start talking about you know maybe doing a bodybuilding show, that's where I would utilize that strategy. If I really felt like I needed this like boost, but again, like to you know figure out like a cup of rice and like. Yeah. I, I don't I don't want to be in that category. I don't like doing that. Um, I don't count calories, I don't track, I don't um, I don't have Tupperware. I don't carry food well, except for the cod liver that I brought you today. I don't typically carry food around with me. Um, I'm not like popping food in the microwave at work. So for me, personally, some forms of fasting works great. And I don't know if you want to call it intermittent fasting or just like not eating for a few hours. Fractal eating, as Mark yeah. Sisson calls it. Yeah, yeah, yeah there you yeah. go. That's that's about what it is. Um, I'll give you just a typical day. Typical day, tip, A typical day, I will wake up. I, will, I do a little bit of hippy-dippy stuff because I believe in some of these things. So I'll go outside. I'll see the sun. I will walk in my front yard a little bit barefoot. Um, it's a practice I've been doing for a while now, and that's just – feeling good for me. I feel like I uh, don't have any injuries, don't have any pain, body's feeling good. I feel like I'm getting more mobile and getting some good results. And it could be because of some of those practices along with a handful of other things. 
pop back inside and I have what I call the super smelly shake, which is uh, iced coffee with uh, my brand uh, within you, uh, steak shake with, uh, I'll usually throw some of my hydration in there as well. And uh, that's kind of like a chocolate, like mocha type of thing almost. Drink that, go to work. Um, or usually I'll go and like either lift or run, depending on the time of year. In the uh, summertime, I will most likely go and lift and then I will run later in the day to get more sun. Um, so I'll go, to the, I'll go to the gym, I'll do like, uh, like lift and or run and then podcast and then I may lift and or run after the podcast and then I haul my home and then I go and eat. And the foods that I usually consume are pretty much like maybe about five or six different things. Um, various forms of meat. I do like seafood a lot. I think that people are kind of, I don't think everyone has to eat seafood, but I do think that a lot of people are missing out. I, I do think there's some value in not just the omega-3s that you get from uh, fish and not fish oil. I, I don't, again, I don't, I'm not against supplementation, but I think that you have to do a lot of other things right in order for supplementation to mm -hmm. even really work. Agreed. So if you were going to have fish oil on top of occasionally having some fish or being conscious of finding other sources of omega-3s, I would be more on board with that than you just thinking that you're going to get everything you need from a pill. Um, but uh, I like oysters a lot. I like shrimp. Um, I like uh, scallops. So all those things are sort of fair game. Salmon, mackerel. And then, you know, when people think of meat, they just think of steak all the time. Yeah. And so I think it's time we get a little bit more creative. I do eat a lot of steak. Piedmontese beef, I'm a huge fan of that uh, product. They're a sponsor of my podcast, and they have the leanest meat, and it's super tender at the same time. Grass-fed, grass-finished. I think people should try to do that wherever they can. If they can't, I don't think that's like the missing piece in your late weight loss journey slash health journey, because I think the hierarchy of most people's health in the United States is to take care of the weight problem mm -hmm. and to take care of the weight problem. Um, and we can get to this in a moment, but to take care of the weight problem, I think people need to chop out a lot of fat calories that they're consuming. Um, but to kind of round out my day, I will you know, have dinner with one of those forms of meat, um, sometimes a potato. Um, sometimes after a run, I might have like some fruit. Sometimes before a run, I might have some fruit something like that and then i'll usually have like another protein shake or i might make in the ninja creamy um which is the greatest thing ever do you have one of those i don't but i, I need to get they're, one. Uh, they're yeah. unbelievable yeah. i mean it change your life <laughs> it's yeah. it's crazy you can make uh you can make ice cream that has like 90 grams of protein <laughs> and and just like <laughs> seven or eight grams of fat or something it needs awesome. some fat in there but really amazing uh, macros and just a nice way to like you know finish your night off with a little little dessert Heck yeah go to bed and like repeat that's pretty much uh the way i eat in a nutshell so it sounds like the biggest lever that you can pull based on your diet okay if i need to button it up it's just reducing the fat a little bit reducing the fat is a huge part of it yeah. um so there's there's a lot of things to consider right so i did mention like not eating for periods of time so that can get tricky if you don't have fat because fat is um Fat is something that can kind of make the food last longer, can make yeah. the digestion slower. And so if you start to pull fat out, you can start to feel really hungry. But hunger, I don't think, is like an enemy of ours. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. feeling some pulse of hunger here and there, I think, is actually kind of a nice thing. Yeah. Um, I, actually, I actually like that. But what I've noticed is that doing that, doing that like every single day and doing that to like a... Um, kind of sitting in that for hours on end is not not a great spot for me to be yeah. so i need to be conscious of that too because i do like to run and i do like to lift and at some point it will be too much and i'll just wear myself to nothing <laughs> have you seen sort of that stuff that implies that there's almost two types of hunger like when you get really hungry and you're like actually like i am hungry it's a like a protein related response mm. where essentially there's a different level of hunger. It's like being a little bit hungry when you have kind of that, that glucagon spike, insulin right. drops, glucagon, you know, whatever. A little bit of elevation of glucagon that's telling you, hey, yeah, like we're out of food, you know, whatever. A um, little bit of AMPK phosphorylation happening mm -hmm. and this, all the downstream stuff that's saying, yeah, you know, you're currently in a deficit, 
but maybe it's not necessarily time to eat. And like when you're in tune with your body, you feel that. You feel, uh, it's almost like how you feel with maybe a fasted workout in the morning, where you're like, yeah, like by the end of it, you're kind of hungry, but you're not ravenous. But mm-hmm. then there's those periods of time where like, I am actually feeling fatigued, I'm feeling hungry. And there's people that claim, and there's actually some legitimate research behind it. So like, yeah, that's a more protein related. Like when you start starving of protein, it's like an mm-hmm. elevated hunger response. So when you start getting to this point of, I am really effing hungry, it usually it seems to be somewhat protein related. Mm. But what's interesting is obviously these different things come into play. Like I've been on four or five day fasts before where I never reached that point of feeling ravenously hungry Mm. so i'm sure it's highly individual i mean i'm sure your level of fat adaptation plays a role and just being used to it Mm -hmm. so i don't know how much i completely buy into it Um, it seems like if you if you push your hunger off like once or twice it's like not that big of a deal but sometimes it does feel like it comes roaring back with like a vengeance and i don't know what the difference is i don't know why Sometimes it 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 fe- I don't know why sometimes it feels like I'm going to kill somebody unless yeah. I get some food. Or know? like if I fast versus doing a bone broth fast, I'm infinitely more hungry on a bone broth fast, even though I'm taking in calories. Right? It's like <laughs> explain that. If right? I eat breakfast, I'm I'm super hungry. It's game over. Yeah, it's <laughs> you know I'm doing this thing right now. I'm like I'm training for this. Uh, long ruck in mm-hmm. Normandy, France. And so like my training protocol for it has me rucking quite a bit. And Chris Hinshaw, who wrote the program for me, uh, and I'm doing the nutrition part, He the one the one say he did have on, he and I are very aligned nutritionally. Like mm-hmm. He's a big fan of fasted training. I know that is a point of contention for a lot of people. I still stand behind. I feel like maybe there's not evidence to support it 100%, but it just, there's something about it maybe not training fasted, but training in a depleted state, whether you're fasted or just depleted, right? Being depleted does something. Like when you're depleted of carbs and you're depleted of fuel and you're just in a serious depleted state and you train in that fashion, it's the simple train low, uh, train high or sleep low studies, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, like it, it does do something. But anyway, the one nutritional point that he did add in there that he's like, hey, I want to take some control of this. He's like, I want to have you get up one day out of the week when you're doing a double day of your long rucks. Like, get up in the morning, you're going to eat prior to your ruck that day. And you're gonna go ruck like eight miles or something. And then you're gonna fast the rest of the day. And then you're gonna do your evening ruck close to 12 hours after your morning ruck fasted. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that's not really fasted. I ate that day. And then I'm like, wait a minute. No, it's fasted. Like it just was the same day. It was a different kind of fast. It was like a midday fast. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, you're doing this, you know, more for the mental thing. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, it's going to be so much harder for you. Like if you woke up in the morning and you were 12 hours into a fast, you could go out and grab that ruck. No problem. He's like, but do it and tell me how much harder it is to eat breakfast and then fast the rest of the day and do that ruck at an end of the day fast when you're just flat out depleted, but you've already had Mm -hmm. hunger signals. He's right. It was infinitely harder. I was thinking about food the whole time I was rucking. And he had told me, he's like, this is a psychological thing. The reason that I have you do that is not because there's something magically metabolic going on. He's like, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But it's like, when you go into these long rucks, 30, 40, 50, 60 miles, he's like, you need to be able to psychologically deal with mm-hmm. being hungry and being miserable. And this is the best way we can simulate that without depleting you so much that it would be deleterious to your training. So he's like, we can simulate misery by having you eat in the morning, train, remain fasted, train again, where you're just thinking about food, you're just thinking about finishing because you want to get done and that's when you get to eat again. And he was right. Mm. That second ruck, I'm just like, every step, I'm just like, ah, I'm gonna have some ground beef when I get back. (laughs) That ground beef sure sounds good. You know, it's pretty wild. I would say, I don't know if I've noticed, like, I definitely noticed feeling good doing stuff fasted, but I'm not really sure if I, other than my powerlifting days, which was different. Uh, I don't really know if I've noticed like being fueled well by food. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not like out on a run being like, whoa, this runs so easy because I ate a bunch of rice. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever really experienced that before. And lifting a little bit because, you know, you get a pump and you also, um, I used to eat before I would go to the gym and bench press, I used to eat what I call bench bagels. And uh, this this is actually like, so we get some smelly science here. Um, 
you know, I used to say the gluten is free. And when I would have, <laughs> when I would have bagels, I'm like, it's got gluten. It's supposed to cause inflammation. And uh, <laughs> I, I want to be inflamed. I want to be like puffy. I want to be like as big as possible. And so I ate, uh, I'd have three bagels and they were salt bagels. And I wouldn't even eat them with butter that they were like almost like sourdough. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> this is not like training advice, but uh, what it would do is it would literally make me heavier yeah. and, I, and I would feel uh, fuller. And I think a lot of like bodybuilders, a lot of other people, a lot of power lifters um, can attest to this, having like that pressure and then having mm -hmm. your muscles kind of swelled up and maybe even being like just more bloated. Yeah. Like it sounds like, doesn't sound like a great idea to be no, bloated. From an internal leverage standpoint. For much sense. of anything, but for lifting yeah. to have this like internal pressure is actually like a, a great advantage. But again, uh, back to my main point, it's like I, I've done stuff where I'm like, wow, my brain's really firing, my body feels like it's really firing, and you know, I, I didn't even eat anything, you know? But I would also say there have been times where, again, I haven't felt an extra bonus from food necessarily, again, except for maybe with a little bit of lifting, but I, uh, I have felt before, like if I fasted too long or fasted too much or it's too many days in a row, I've been in the middle of some workouts or some runs where my legs are way more yeah. tired, yeah. I'm breathing harder, my heart rate's higher. And those are things that sometimes you're like, what is this? And then you just think that you're like off for the day. Like you can't, mm -hmm. you can't really figure out what it's accountable for. But back to what I said about stress earlier about like, you know, lying down and, and and really trying to get yourself to relax and breathe. I mean, what do carbohydrates do? You know? Yeah, they definitely make you relax. Yeah, carbohydrates yeah. like, whew. Yeah. Especially, I mean, you know, we got like things like ice cream and pizza and they, they have like so many other things going on than them just being carbohydrates. They're loaded with a lot of fat and things that override your ability to recognize like almost how much you ate and so on. But, uh, I mean, think about it. you get done with a run. If you were to have like a smoothie or something, like that yeah. would just feel incredible. It feels yeah. like it's like going going. <laughs> the like glucose is going like right to your brain. You know. I talked with uh, Mike Isertel about this. Like he, I asked him, is there you know legitimate research behind carbohydrates post training as far as like sympathetic fair parasympathetic? He's like, oh, like undoubtedly. He's yeah, it like, probably knocks your cortisol just, down. Exactly bit, what yeah. it does, and that's the thing is like, I don't think cortisol is one of these things where after training it's gonna like yeah completely destroy your effect. Remember how they- Or cortisol is going to make you fat or something. Yeah, yeah. there used to be this thing like, oh, you need to keep your training under 50 minutes because that's when cortisol is going to start spiking. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't think that's a thing like we used to kind of like talk about. But there is something effective about, okay, yes, carbohydrates right after training sort of just kick you into this recovery mode mm. that you, from a CNS standpoint, just wouldn't be ready for. I'm really learning just the power of proper rest i used to think that rest was just taking a rest day mm. but now it's more about actually i'd rather train a little bit every day but rest mm -hmm. and recover appropriately throughout the rest of the day and that includes adequate nutrition adequate fuel enough calories and strangely enough i have found such a monumental difference in my recovery day in and day out by because I train in the morning almost entirely, but then by adding an extra walk in or something in the evening has actually made my recovery so mm -hmm. much. But also just being being in control of the volume, right? It now makes more sense for me to make a small deposit every day than a moderate to large deposit mm. five days out of the week, as far as my training is concerned. And body composition wise, it's reflecting better. Performance-wise, it's reflecting better. Mental well-being, it's reflecting better. Sleep, it's reflecting better. But for some reason, I still sit there thinking it's not enough. Like, I need to train. And I really, I was thinking about this when I was walking yesterday. I was like, if my performance improves, but my body composition took a negative hit, I could see why I might say, oh, I need to go back to my old ways. But my body composition's improving, my performance is improving, and my rest is improving, all by toning it down a little bit some days mm. and pushing it harder other days and just really throttling things differently. Mm. And I'm like, okay, well, yet I still struggle with is it being enough? I'm like, every single box that I could possibly want to check is being checked. So why is it that you still want to go hard all the time? And it's like, okay, at this point, 
I am now comfortable in looking at myself and saying that is purely a psychological ego piece there. You're trying to satisfy something mentally mm -hmm. that is detrimental to your physical body. Um, it's been amazing. Like when you say, okay, well, what else do I really want? Because if I start adding more, it's just going to be a problem. I think every day, you know, needs to be like a six or a seven. Yeah. And that's not really romantic. I think people want to kind of David Goggins it and have mm -hmm. things be much harder. But what they may not recognize or realize from someone like David Goggins or someone uh, like my friend Zach Bitter, like these, these guys, um, they're training at very low percentages a lot of the times to get better. Mm -hmm. So on a scale of one to ten, you know, or, or if you take percentages, they're at like 60%. Yeah. You know, David Goggins, you know, he even has like a quote, like you, you're, you, you know, you think you're going really hard. You think you're going hundred percent, but you're only like 60% there. But truthfully to like have your training be dialed in correctly for running, for lifting, for any of these things, a lot of people, not always, not everybody, but a lot of people are going to use lower percentages more frequently to build up their strength or build up their tolerance to any form of exercise. Um, sprinting is the same way, the same bolt. You know, he he only ran his fastest times when he had to. Yeah. You know, he didn't he didn't he didn't waste that in training. He probably ran seventy percent of that. He probably ran sixty percent of that, and maybe once in a while, his coach would say, "Hey, let's kind of see." Where you're at, I want you to go about 80. But if even if you look at the Olympics, like what did he do? He just like he just stopped. <laughs> he yeah. like he ran and he just slowed down and he like still crushed everybody. Yeah. So these people that we follow and these people that we admire that lift these heavy weights and run these cool speeds and stuff, Nick Bear and all these other guys, <laughs> we get excited, but we don't really realize. I mean, for myself as well, building a squat over a thousand pounds, uh, the most of the time, like a huge percentage of my training, probably I would say about 80% of my training was utilizing around 400 to 500 pounds, which is a lot of weight, right? It's a lot of weight, but it's, but it's, relative it's to half yeah. of a thousand pounds, right? Because it was about execution. It was about putting a positive input into my body. And the inputs that we put into our body have to be, they don't all have to be positive. They can be, we can deal with all kinds of different stress. But how much stress are you really going to be able to deal with? Yep. How much stress are you going to really be able to handle? And a lot of that has to do with, if we're talking about stress from exercise, and we're talking about stress from like nutrition, well, that's just, you're kind of like meathead stress, yeah. you know? And somebody can build a good tolerance towards that. But what about your mental stress? Yeah. You know, are you a maniac? Are you a lunatic? Are you like real, real angry? Are you... Um, you know, having trouble expressing your emotions? Are you uh, being dragged around by your emotions? You know, or, or do you have better balance? Are you able to be stoic in your life? Have you reviewed some of these things? So there's so many things in health and nutrition that we just don't ever talk about. I mean, people, there's so many things that, there's so many things that come into play that just aren't fair. So it's not fair that like you have to have so many things in place because you even have to have a good relationship you know, try being lonely, you know, yeah. just try that on for size. Like that is going to make, that is going to make your diet choices really difficult. Like I, I'm, I'm a big teddy bear. Like I love smooching on my wife. I've been married for 23 years. You take that away from me and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, yeah. I'm going to be fat and I'm probably not going to yeah. be as motivated. I'm very motivated by my wife. She exercises and swims and does all this cool stuff too. So, uh, we don't really realize that if, if sometimes you take some of these like fundamental things that we probably take for granted just pull that away you can't see your kids for three months yeah it's like oh like i'm not saying you're gonna get fat like maybe you'll lean into it more and just be like i'm gonna concentrate on this even more but it's gonna be a rough go in terms of your overall health yeah yeah you don't think about the the arguments you have the conflicts you have and how that pulls from this bucket of stamina that you have and that's it's pulling hard. It's pulling really hard. <laughs> yeah. And you just think, oh, well, I'm not physically stressed. Well, yeah, you are. It's just not, you know, stress on your bicep. You mm -hmm. know, it's a completely different ball game. And I think that there's certain things that when I'm stressed, I lean into more moderate lifting, whereas I used to, like running was a coping mechanism for me for stress, but I realized that running was like this cardiorespiratory stressor that was just infinitely more destructive when I was mentally stressed, even though it provided me with like this feeling of reprieve and relief when I would do it. The stress 
because running is stressful on the body, especially when you're, you know, a Clydesdale running around. Like it's just, it's a lot of eccentric contraction. Yeah. It's a lot of muscle breakdown. And that was just too much. I'm like, okay, when days when I'm stressed and being able to recognize that is, is huge because if you maybe like, go on a walk instead, go on a walk or just go lift, but don't try to destroy the place. You know, it's like, because I feel like I do feel like putting some tension on the muscles is always a good reminder and always centers me. And you can probably attest to this and this is going to get like woo woo and weird, but it says 50 pounds is always 50 pounds. hundred pounds is always hundred pounds. 500 pounds is always 500 pounds. Sometimes it feels like a thousand. Sometimes mm. it feels like a hundred, right? But that 500 pounds is 500 fucking pounds. And it's just, it doesn't lie to you. So I feel like it's the most grounding thing outside of physically grounding that I can do. So when I'm stressed, it helps me. Whereas running is, there's like all these subjective kind of like, oh, I don't feel like, okay, well, I'm extra winded and this and that. There's these other things like, yes, you could say the same argument, like five miles is five miles. Sure. But something about the weight, I just feel like it's just good to put yourself under a little bit of moderate load, even if it's not crazy heavy. Whereas running, I would have a tendency to push it too much and then I'd get sick or something because then it's like, okay, mm. well, push it too hard. I'm already, central nervous system's already taxed. And it comes to a different discussion of like, when you're, when you're in the weight room, you're creating some damage, you're creating some response, but you're really not putting that much of an impact on your body unless you're like doing something crazy. like. You'd be lucky if you're burning 200 calories in a weight training session. I mean, mm -hmm. unless you're doing like an EMOM kind of thing, right? So if you're doing a typical bodybuilding hypertrophy session, I think it's stressful on the body, but it's not as stressful as going and doing a Metcon or going for a run. I think, you know, what, as some of what you're touching upon, it kind of reminds me of this idea of like working in rather than working out. You know, go to the gym and you're, you're, you're like working out. And I think that we think that we're going to like work out our problems, that we're literally going to work them out or you – have heard people before, you know, say, oh, if you're stressed or have anxiety, you know, maybe get like a punching bag and you can get your, like your aggression out. Um, you're not really getting your aggression out when you do that. I'm not saying that it's not healthy. It, it, it probably still is a good move to just, to just burn some energy. Uh, it's probably, is almost probably a, a good, it's almost always probably a good idea to, to do something like that, but you're actually just expressing more of that. You know, you have this heavy bag in front of you and you're pissed off about something and now you're smashing it. You're, you're, um, you're not being like introspective mm -hmm. on that particular position that you have. And so a different strategy, which is probably, again, is probably not that I don't, people might not, it's not that appealing, but is to think about what made me pissed off. Like what got me this way? Because no one can make you that way. It's your own mind. It's your own perception. It's your own reality that you're kind of building. You're, you're bending uh, the situations around you to put you into this state. And it might have something to do with your dad. It might have something to do with your upbringing. It might have to do with somebody wronged you. Or There's so many different scenarios, right? Um, but you still made yourself angry. How do you work your way through that? Going to the gym is um, it's just covering up your problems. It's just pausing it, just like alcohol. I think the gym and alcohol are actually way more related than we. <laughs> I can see that. Yeah. Than, than maybe than maybe we know. Um, because I think alcohol. I actually I actually like alcohol. I haven't drank in a long time, but I actually enjoy alcohol. But I think alcohol is like a pause. Yeah. You know, it's like let me just hit this. I'm going to pause my life and pause everything around me. And I'm just going to like forget about everything, sweep everything under the rug. I'm just going to enjoy this. Yeah. I think that uh, exercise is a distraction for the right person, for the wrong person, I guess. Exercise for someone that is maybe not like you and I, I do think that it helps because they feel a change, a, a state change, right? There's, there's nothing that is going to elicit a greater like state mm -hmm. change for someone that is, well, I guess healthy and unhealthy, but for someone that especially is, is unhealthy, it will help you work through stuff for will, sure. But for some people Absolutely. like us, I do feel like it can, it's a drug. It is flat out a mm -hmm. drug and it is an addiction. It's flat out an addiction and being able to manage that is extremely difficult. Yeah, We know how all of us are behind closed doors and we're like, <laughs> Like it's kind of cool because this guy's like me as well. Like yeah. he, he just simply wants to do better, and sometimes yeah. it's to his own detriment. Do you feel like <laughs> there's a problem with this constant need to optimize? I mean, we've got the the Huberman boys out there. We've got all like this, just like optimize, 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 optimize. Like, where do we draw the line? 
do you think with with optimization <clears throat> yeah i think i mean you're starting to see like a lot of like satire of it you're starting to see a lot of like skits and stuff yeah, the like thing that you posted the other day <laughs> yeah. was funny yeah. yeah there's a lot of uh people poking fun at it and kind of rightfully so because it is getting to be kind of crazy and i'm out there you know in my underwear in my front yard walking around <laughs> and grounding and things like that but i think you know uh I think we're just trying to find some truths. You know, it, yeah. it does seem like we've been lied to about a lot of things. It seems like, um, I don't know how intentional it is or the government or conspiracies or whatever, but uh, it seems like from a nutritional standpoint, it seems like, you know, this is supposed to be a free country and you have to send your kids to school, otherwise you go to jail. And then like, what do they teach you in that school? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things where you're like, ah, you know, I'm not saying that school's bad. No, I hear you though. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I agree with a lot of stuff, and I I understand why things are set up the way they are. I'm not proposing that I start to run anything, and I don't have solutions. <laughs> <laughs> but but I do think that uh, you know, we're we're just trying to find answers, and so I actually think that a lot of these things. Um, you know, the, the, we got, you know, Brian Johnson and you got old school guys like Dave Asprey and Ben Greenfield. And, um, we got, you know, Paul Saladino who actually, I think more recently he's been kind of leaning into this, like, like I'm studying myself, yeah. you know what I mean? I think, I think for a while he's trying to tell everybody like, Hey, you have to do this cause he was excited. Mm -hmm. And now I really like his perspective cause he's kind of flipped it yeah. and he's like, you know what? I apologize for doing that so much but i'm just passionate about it and this is really helping me a lot and so maybe this will help you but the stuff that we're starting to hear about like what things like the carnivore diet or what some of these dietary uh, interventions are doing for people or some of these breathing practices or even just getting sunlight like we're starting to learn so many really really cool things and I think we're just, we're at the, we're in a really good spot right now because I think we're continuing to learn some really awesome things that will, it will help people in a way that so much of this stuff will be way easier five years from now and way cheaper. We don't have to do it all either. Right. I think that's what people get. And not all the time. Yeah. You know, there's a time and place and a setting to do each, you know, to do each individual thing. I mean, if you, I mean, it's just like the jokes that are out there. I mean, if you did everything that I suggested people do or get excited about or at least learn more about, I mean, you wouldn't have a life. You wouldn't have time for anything. Same if you did everything that Huberman talks about. It's just there's protocols, but then there's also, yeah, I mean, we have real lives. You can't do everything all at once. But I don't think any harm comes from learning that the sun is good. Mm -hmm. I don't think any harm comes from learning that you could take a break from food now and then. That's an interesting thing, the sun. You know, yeah. it's like we've been so warned about the sun. And yeah. then especially with like our children and stuff, you're like, you're really, you got a lot of concern and you should, you know, you should be concerned. I'm taking my child to the beach. Like, what are we going to do? But I think the first things you should think about rather than just like sunscreening them to death, I think that you should think about proper clothing, proper hat, especially yeah. if you're going on like a boat or something, you don't, don't want your neck exposed. It's really easy to get burnt. Like still a sunburn, like just because we're learning some cool benefits of the sun doesn't mean the sun can't burn you. And there's people that are so fair skinned, they need to be really super cautious with yeah. how much time they spend in the sun. But the first things you're gonna think about is just like what an animal would do or what you would naturally do. And you would naturally just go, like you wouldn't, there's probably not a lot in history where we really spent a lot of time intentionally sunbathing, you know, yeah. there's probably like maybe just naturally like went outside and like ate fruit and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> but you yeah. probably weren't like laying out yeah, trying to like sure. get tan, you know? And if you were, and you think about it in a, in a region where maybe they would be more fair skin, they'd go out and they'd be like, Oh shoot, I burned, but I got to do this again. So I'm going to find a way to just cover up. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I still need to go out and forage and you still need to go pick you my build the tolerance berries. for it too. Yeah. yeah so you, but you're, you're not going to like say, okay, well I, I can't do it. It's necessary mm -hmm. for the village to survive and I'm right. just going to stay indoors. I think the dose makes the poison. And I mean, it's in people that are fair skinned, they're going to, they're going to cover up appropriately, but maybe their faces are still exposed. Their hands are still exposed. Mm -hmm. They're getting the right amount of, dare I say, photosynthesis. You know, it's like you need a certain level mm -hmm. of that. And I feel like if you just think about what makes the most sense, like maybe just if you're prone to burning, cover up a little bit, you know, think about it like that. I think that's a great philosophy. 
but also, I mean, just how you're exposed as a as a young kid probably makes a difference too. I would right. imagine. I would imagine that, like, if we were taking a step back a thousand years, it probably would have lower instances of burning just because there's right. just more exposure. But it doesn't. It's so hard to do that because you'd be dosing it in like a very strategic, almost prescribed sunlight dosage. I think we were talking last time. Like, how funny would mm-hmm. it be if like it got to a point where your doctor wrote you a script and said you need like nine minutes of sunshine today mm-hmm. you know but then as funny as it would be it would legitimize it and people right. would start to take it serious right. whereas like maybe it's not a, a like a, a legal script you know maybe it's not something where it's like okay you can't get sunlight unless you have a prescription the sun is really interesting yeah. it's really like it's it's really like a beautiful and perfect thing um, I used to hate the sun. I used to want it to burn out because I was big and fat. <laughs> and, and the sun was like my enemy because I was always sweaty. But uh, nowadays I've learned to embrace it. But if you if you just feel the sun, like literally just, just sit there and just you have your shirt off or something, uh, you got some skin exposed to the sun, you can feel when it starts to be too dangerous. Yeah. It doesn't take long. I mean, if it's windy out and cold and you're at high altitude, that's kind of a different story. That's a little bit harder to be in tune with. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, if it starts to be spring or starts to be summertime, you'll kind of know when to get out of the sun. And the first three hours of the day and the last three hours of the day, as long as it's not dead center in the middle of the summer, and depending on where you live, but mainly here in the United States, you most likely aren't going to get burned, but you need to still build a, probably a tolerance, again, if you're yeah. really, really fair-skinned. I find the sun to be super interesting, and I found what you said were saying earlier about fasting, and I can't stop thinking about this idea. And I don't know if there'll ever be studies that will ever show this or prove this or how we could have like more evidence of this. But there's weird that goes on in our body. Our body makes energy. Does it make something out of nothing? No, but there's a lot inside the body already. So if we're fasting, maybe the body's using some glucose. Maybe the body's liberating some fat. Um, if we're in some sort of starving state, maybe the body has to figure out a way to use utilize some protein or something like that. Your body, the sun, and cold are all things that have the ability when we utilize them to spin your energy up. And that is super fascinating to me. And it's really not thought about that much. We, we kind of know it from the bodybuilding and we know it from, um, there's a lot of bodybuilding coaches out there. That's, they're like, dude, I don't really care what anyone says about fasted cardio. It works. Yeah. Like it exponentially makes a difference. I have been working with, you know, Hani Rambad. Uh, he helped me in my bodybuilding show. He coaches, uh, he coached Jay Cutler, he coached, um, Chris Bumstead, I mean, he's worked with the best of the best. And uh, I was very grateful that he helped me during my bodybuilding show. And he was like, yeah, do all your cardio fasted. Yep. And he was like, it just it just flat out works. And, just, so, yeah, and so we yeah. think about some of these things like we kind, we kind of forget, you know, if like one of these guys in here that's working, if, the, if they were just kind of sitting over in the corner and they were kind of bummed, you'd be like, yo, let's go for a walk. Yeah. And, and why would you suggest that? Well, it's, it's going to spin up energy. The guy's over there. He's kind of bummed. We're going to go on a walk. We're going to go outside. Being in nature is like almost a completely separate thing than just the sun itself. But there's these things. I mean, being in nature is going to spin up some energy, too. And so I just I find it I find it to be interesting that we only really look at our food. And we yeah. need to start we need to start looking at some other things, because, like, why is it that no. a workout why is it that a workout can spin you up so much and you can feel so like yeah, energized it's not coming from, from food at that point right i mean right. Or, and well, it came from some previous food yeah, exactly. we're not but saying like but it's, it's being liberated in some weird way i mean i get where you're i mean 100 yeah, percent. I, I mean imagine just doing like 20 jumping jacks and 20 push-ups like 15 times a day like <laughs> I mean, would you just be like all f- jacked up all day long <laughs> The sun is a burning ball of gas and it's energy, <laughs> yeah. right? So, I mean, it's just, yeah. it, it's foolish to think that there's not an energy that's coming from that doing something. Mm-hmm. And I know we're not plants, but I can't help but unthink the fact that plants grow when they get acted upon by the sun, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, photosynthesis, yes, but it, like, come on, like, there's got to be something that's happening reacting with minerals doing something we can't calculate and look at all this stuff there's not enough research dollars in the world to look at it right and we're only who knows like we know nothing about absolutely nothing but i firmly believe that if you go out in the sun 
there is an energizing component of it. I think we're getting something from it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's cumulative, but I also think it's immediate too. I agree a ton with that. Just to kind of go back on something uh, we were talking about earlier, you mentioned uh, fat, and I just wanted to kind of talk about that a little bit more. Do you think that, I mean, I realize like people are like different sizes and stuff, but I think even, (laughs) I think as different as we can be, we're all pretty much, we're, we're very similar, you know, there could be like a five foot tall girl and like a seven foot tall guy. I realize there's some discrepancies in like body size and stuff like that. But do you think it's like even possible for someone to like really gain a lot of body fat if they are, if they only eat like 60 grams of fat a day? It's a good question. <laughs> I think it would be pretty hard. I think that it is pretty energetically difficult to go through de novo lipogenesis and convert carbs into fat it's like a seven six or seven step process i mean it's it's not efficient it's not an efficient way of storing fat absolutely can welcome back to the 1980s everybody (laughs) low fat diets coming back that's probably what that's what they're going to clip clip out of this and talk about me but the (laughs) the fat simply stores easier as fat and we've seen this time and time again But I do think that the sugar, excess sugar, excess carbohydrates damage the metabolism enough that it becomes exponentially worse with the excess fat. The ability to deal with the excess fat, the ability to liberate fats, the ability to oxidize fats decreases so much from the broken metabolism that could have been spawned by the high sugar diet that then that becomes significantly worse. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's people that are more efficient at oxidizing fats. And I think we've seen it in the literature, right. although it's, I mean, it's it clearly if someone is doing a ketogenic diet, like they're, they're leveraging those better. Mm-hmm. But I do find that even with a ketogenic diet, like you've, there's a tipping point where too much fat definitely starts to still store. Right. But it's also, are you dealing with people with broken metabolisms mm-hmm. too? So I do think that the biggest lever that people can pull when it comes time to like quickly drop some, you know, fat pounds is, yeah, probably reducing fat. But if you're trying to course correct a disrupted metabolism, I do think it's a combination of reducing fat being the lever that you can pull as the sort of building block, but pulling out the carbs as the way of saying, hey, this is the reason that the mitochondrial machinery is somewhat dysfunctional because it's just overload Mm. but at the end of the day i do think it's kind of a tandem approach i think that approach of uh high carb high fat together is seriously detrimental i think Mm. that is the problem that we're at and we were talking about before we were filming like i can't really think of a whole lot of reasons from any evolutionary standpoint why our ancestors would have (laughs) an amazing surplus of fats and carbs at one time like I, i just that doesn't i can't really think of a situation where they would have Let's just sell, call a number. Like, okay, let's say something that you, if you were to have a couple of Twinkies and you had maybe 100 grams of sugar and whatever, maybe 60 grams of fat, I'm pulling that out, totally out of my rear end. I don't know exactly, mm-hmm. but let's say something like that, a typical processed food calorie bomb. And let's just say 100 grams of sugar to 60 to 75 grams of fat. What would that look like in the wild? Like, what would that look like? Okay, so let's say 75 grams of fat, that'd probably be like, two ribeyes Mm -hmm. maybe and maybe oh shoot like five to seven apples (laughs) or if it was berries which are so much more like yeah it's more fibery 10 cups do you i just don't see that really happening that often i mean maybe there would be Mm -hmm. a freak freak occasion but certainly like if someone so if someone's eating two twinkies a day that would mean that from an ancestral standpoint, like they were coming across two giant, juicy, fatty steaks and a bunch of fruit to equal 100 grams of, let's just say glucose, not even fructose. So in that case, you'd need double the amount mm. because how much fructose and glucose is in the fruit. That just seems unreasonable to happen every day. So I think we have a bombardment of fats and carbs coming in at the same time that just doesn't make sense for our body to be able to handle. And, you know, if, if those two things did come together, you know, some fats and some carbohydrates, it would be in the summertime. And it you might know? also make sense that the body says, oh, wow, thank you. Let's store as much of this as we can. Yeah. 
it would, it would there's actually more make, sunlight. There's more yeah. activity. You're doing more things. You're you're now up from seven a.m. till at least seven p.m. Probably um, on a lot of days because there's still some sunlight, and you can actually gather up the food and bring it back to everybody, and all these things. And and uh, like you said, you can kind of store some of that. It's interesting that carbohydrates, like the natural carbohydrates, don't have fats with them. Mm-hmm. Like I, the only things I can kind of, kind of think of. Is like I guess you got like nuts, but it's like there's like small amount of carbs. Like it's not really carbs, like more fibery, right? Yeah, and I mean there's some like maybe some weird, maybe coconut kind of a nut. But then what's some of the there's a couple of those weird fattier tropical fruits. I can't name off the top of my Mm. head, but I know there's some that have like a few grams of fat, but nothing crazy, right? It just doesn't make a lot of sense that you would have that. Like almost all carb sources seem to be lean. It's just they get adulterated through <laughs> yeah. whatever it is we do to them. Yeah, and then even protein, you know, protein is uh, doesn't come by itself usually either. Usually it's accompanied by fat. Yeah. And so those those two are supposed to come together. But when we're talking about like trying to help somebody lose weight or we're talking about somebody like you're saying, I think you know the a kind of a broken metabolism thing is an interesting interesting thing to think about or look at and uh, I I don't think that you and I are necessarily saying like I think it, I think it's easy. Like if you're if you're way overweight, your metabolism probably isn't working very efficiently. And if you've struggled to lose weight in the past, not just because you can't hang on and you can't do the diet, but if you legitimately, you know, have had diet interventions before and you're walking more, and it seems like it's your body's a little stubborn to losing some weight, you probably do have a broken metabolism. Then how do you unbreak your metabolism? You unbreak it by being healthy and by having healthy practices. And people may have heard similar speeches from people that are successful. It's like, well. Man, I want to be successful. How do I get in on that? Well, in order to be successful, you have to first become a success. You have to do a lot of things that successful people do. And so if you want to be healthy, you have to adhere to a bunch of things that healthy people adhere to for a while. Then your body will become healthy. And then as you become healthy, it'll be way easier for you to lose weight. I'm not saying that you can't lose weight if you're unhealthy, but it's just going to probably be harder. It probably won't feel as good. Yeah, and I think at the end of the day, it's it's the sustainability. I mean, without that, I think that's where you and I have both come. It's like, what is the easiest way for us to be able to do this day in and day out with the least amount of mental resistance? Yeah, yeah. I don't want resistance in my life. Like, I'm just at that point. Like, the resistance that I want in my life, I want to have there for reason. But I want to be able to overcome resistance that I'm faced with on a daily basis because it's going to happen. But why would I electively add resistance? It's mm-hmm. like I even think that way about like cold plunging and things like that too. It's like, I'll do it if I feel like doing it, Mm -hmm. but but, uh, to have a protocol of adding additional stress, it doesn't make a ton of sense to me Mm -hmm. when I'm like, I'm already adding enough stress through things that I enjoy adding stress through. And occasionally that is going to be a cold plunge. Occasionally it is going to be a sauna, but the moment that it starts becoming like, Oh my gosh, I'm doing something that's, you know, we, we, like Joe Rogan talks about like kind of, you know, tackling his uh, inner, right? Like when he's like, and I get that, I get that, but I don't want to craft a life where I feel like I have to do that to myself. I would rather be ready to handle the real problem Mm -hmm. than to train myself so much to the point where I'm broken and not actually able to rise to the occasion. And a lot of the special operator or special forces operators that I work with, like they they say all the time, they say like, you you never you don't rise to the occasion, you default to your lowest level of training, mm. which makes a lot of sense, right? But that is for a special forces operator that is ready to has to be ready to go at any time. And the point with them saying that is they say things like, if your training is here and you get into a situation where you have to go to here. <sighs> It's very seldom that you're going to actually like rise to that occasion unless you absolutely need to. And having a like a base level of training that's a little bit higher allows you to rise to that occasion. The delta between rising to the occasion mm-hmm. is a little bit, but the extreme is if you're constantly trying to rise that or make you rise to the occasion every day, there's a ceiling. You're not going to you're going to be so broken that there's no occasion to actually rise to. If that makes sense. Like you're, you're trying mm-hmm. to balance how much you're able to stress yourself 
And I don't want to walk through my life saying like, okay, I need more resistance. I need to log more food because I want to find the easiest path to check all the boxes that I possibly can so that I have the energy to do the things that I love or the energy to rise to the occasion when I need to. Yeah, I think you're just talking about efficiency. Like you, you're efficient. You get to be more efficient at stuff the longer that you do it, the longer that you practice it. The more you enjoy something, the more you're going to do it. Therefore, the more efficiency that you'll have. And things won't feel like they're difficult. And I can look back at stuff that I've done over the years and I can say, it really didn't seem that hard. And the reason why I can say that is because, to me, everything in life works a little bit like it does in the weight room. When you have some resistance, not all the resistance, when you have some resistance, your body can uh, start to acclimate to it. Your body can start to get used to it. Your body can break some tissues down, repair it. You can come back, literally come back stronger. You come back stronger and better every time. And so if you kind of take that same philosophy through your life, the things that you go through, there might be personal things there might be tragedy there might be some things that sideswipe you that you may have uh, not really thought about before but for the most part the work that you do in my opinion it doesn't need to be hard and I hear people all the time talking about how hard you have to work when you're an entrepreneur how hard you have to work if you want to be the uh, you want to be the top dog in this thing you have to have this this fight in you and I, I agree there has to be a point where you can really go but that doesn't necessarily require that you're <laughs> and it all it doesn't mean by any means that you're going like a hundred percent on stuff all the time because that's not an effective way to get there in the first place and so I think a lot of people are thinking they're gonna do stuff with intensity a lot of times I think people are thinking they're gonna do stuff with muscle and all those things I think it re it requires a lot of you and I think that uh, it can just kind of leave you in a state where you're just you're it can leave you in a state where you're just sort of getting flat yeah. you're getting flattened by trying to have all these practices um trying to spin all these plates all the time yeah so uh, i've said this before in other interviews but you know someone told me when i was first getting frustrated when i was lifting i said thomas if you got stronger every workout then everyone would be benching a thousand pounds <laughs> right right i mean it's that simple it's like if you it doesn't work like that it's not a linear progression it's it's always going to be two steps forward, one step back, mm. maybe another step back, maybe three steps forward. And it's just the quicker that you can relate with that and understand that and see that and appreciate that for what it is, be a little bit more methodical about it, be a little bit more mindful of it, the more sustainable it all becomes. Mm. Well, where, where you're at, you know, with uh, this like podcast and, and uh, interviewing so many different people kind of like more recently are you starting to question a lot of your own beliefs more? And are you trying to, like you and I like know each other pretty well. Um, with some of your guests, are you trying to give some of them a little bit more like pushback and stuff like that? I think I can give pushback without it feeling like pushback by just raising interesting questions, mm. uh, by being like hopelessly curious. I feel right. like my just interest in learning and just gaining perspective because for my own selfish reasons, I, I like to learn from people because of my own gain in life too, right? right? Like, so like I, maybe it's a profitable gain or gain with my family or the upper hand in negotiation or whatever. I do have selfish reasons for mm -hmm. wanting to learn from people. Uh, so I genuinely get curious because I'm like, I, I get off on like learning and trying something new. Mm -hmm. I don't get off on the optimization and the performance as much as I used to. I mean, sure, I get excited if I perform well. I'm like, hey, but I'm more excited about reverse engineering what I did to get there right. and the craft and the me mechanics of it. So when I challenge people, it's usually by asking a question that they may not have the answer to or they may not have been expecting or they may have seen as difficult. I, like to ask, I do like to try to ask questions that make them say, I actually don't have the answer for that. Mm. That's kind of a win because for me, not that it's a competition, I'm trying to get them to that point, but I know that that means I've challenged them in a way that they weren't expecting to get challenged mm. and it's not coming at them like on an offensive. Right, it's, right. It's, it's getting them to just think different. And so it's like, how do you quantify challenge? How do you quantify um, resistance? Like Mark, if I asked you to, you know, 
I don't know, tell me how to, I don't even know, something that you're just not well versed in, mm -hmm. that would be a challenge to you. But I'm not going to say, Mark, how do you feel <laughs> about telling people that saturated fat's okay while there are millions of people dying from heart disease? Mm. You know, right? It's like, right. You, don't, you don't have to challenge. Like, I saw that video with Dr. Mike challenging Gundry. Right? Right. Did you see that? I thought it was very interesting. But I also couldn't help and talked about it with my team. I'm like, how do you think that the, that room was after that podcast was done? Like, did he did country just be like, bye, leave, yeah. or did they like shake hands, take a picture, be like, hey, that was nice, thanks? <laughs> like, that's so so awkward. Um, but I also, as a business person, I know like we have platforms and we do have responsibility for what we put out there. But I also don't feel like. I'm going to be rude with people. I'm not a people pleaser, but I don't want to have someone come on yeah. and highlight their flaws and put them on the spot. That's just business practice. That's mm -hmm. just not cool. Like I'd rather just not invite them right. um, if I really don't like them. And yeah, I maybe don't want, didn't vet them enough. Yeah, yeah. I, I just don't want to be in their presence. Yeah. Like that's different. But if there's someone that maybe I disagree with, I'm not here to debate them. I'm here to highlight their viewpoints, and I might challenge with some questions that get them to think. Like I did that with Dave Asprey, like and he, but it was kind of impossible with him because he would just say, no, you know, and right. the other way. But, and that's not even really a knock on him, but then like, then there's other people that'll be like, oh, I didn't really think of that. Or like Paul and I are, are close enough now where um, we can kind of laugh about it. Like he's across from me and he's saying, I, I, I see you uh, smiling. Like he's like, yeah, I think you're you know, probably just agreeing with me. Right. It's nice that you can have that, right? right? Like that's, that's where it, it really needs to be. Like we don't need to be enemies. If we have such an enemy mentality with each other and we're so rigid, mm. like discussions don't go anywhere. It's right. like, you've got to like, you got to, I don't know, what is it, Dale Carnegie? It was a Dale, no, Dale Carnegie said something that was, uh, who's the guy that wrote uh, The Magic of Thinking Big? Mm, um, not sure. Robert, uh, I can't remember, anyway, great book. Like it was one of the best books I ever read that kind of got me started in any form of entrepreneurship whatsoever. And like first they have to like you, then they have to respect you, and then you have to speak with logic and reason. That is how you mm. get someone close to you and be able to have open conversation. They have to like you, they have to respect you, right. and you have to speak with logic and reason. So Mark, you could like me, you might even respect the weights that I can put up or whatever, but if I talked like a lunatic there's the closest deal right? Right, right so i always go back to that like i have to like someone at a certain level to invite them here hmm. you know so like paul saladino do disagree and i do disagree on a lot of things but there's a lot of things i love about paul his like infectious personality his energy his i'm like you are a likable dude even though sometimes he doesn't come across that way online Mar uh, paul is a very likable mm -hmm. dude and okay I actually do respect him in the sense that I respect how he really embodies his practice. And he actually does speak with logic and reason, despite what some people will say. The uh, smartest people you ever meet, um, this is uh, was told to me by a guy named Cal Dietz, who's like one of the best strength coaches in the world. Cal said, uh, and one of the smarter guys I've ever met, he said the smartest people will tell you that they don't know. Yeah. And they'll also tell you, he goes, and even smarter people will tell you that they want to change their answer. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Paul Saladino did. I have text messages with Paul Saladino. I don't know why he never gives me credit, but <laughs> I am the guy that forced him to eat some carbs, or at least I think I am, because I have some texts where we're going back and forth. I'm like, dude, you gotta just, I don't think you understand like what carbs feel like. And I think it wasn't probably too much longer after my bodybuilding show that I did. I was like, have you ever felt like, you know, just like a bunch of like glucose in your muscles? Like it feels amazing. Like it might help you with performance. You yeah. might feel, you know, better when you're doing certain things. And at the time, I don't think he was like lifting that much. You know, he like surfs and does yeah. a lot of other things, which surfing, by the way, seems impossible. I mean, can you surf? No, I, I, I know. Like thoracic doesn't even move that way. I just see people yeah. doing that. I'm like, that's unbelievable. Yeah. I don't get it. But uh, he's he's uh, he loves it, and he's you know incredible with it. But um, yeah, I was talking to him about carbs. I'm like, dude, you got to at least try some fruit, try some rice, try some potatoes. I was trying to really <laughs> encourage him to do yeah. that a while back. No, totally. So I'm glad that I'm glad that he has. I'm glad that he's tried it, and I think that's all that any of us can do. And that's why I was saying. Even the experts aren't experts because even Paul Saladino, while he does know a lot, while you know a lot, I know a lot, we know a lot 
and we know a lot for ourselves and we can help a lot of people. We can help a lot of people in general. We could say, hey, here's some of the general stuff to do. But to try to narrow it down individually on what each person does, I mean, the, the information that you share with a loved one, with a family member on how to lose weight when they're interacting with you a bunch, going back and forth on text, is different than anything you can share here yeah. on the podcast. Because it, no matter how long a podcast is, we can't discuss everything even though we talked about calories at length there's still so much more to continue to talk about on that on that uh, on that point both of us would agree that yes if somebody is to reduce their calories substantially by 500 or 1000 they are literally going to lose weight um but it's like, what's the blowback from that? You know, and yeah. those are like the things that I think it's the reason why we love podcasts because you can just dive into all the little nuances of these for things sure. and talk about them for infinitely because nobody actually really knows. No, agreed, man. Well, <laughs> where can everyone find you, brother? You can find me right over here, sitting across from you, <laughs> eating, eating cod liver. Yeah, exactly. That was amazing. I love, I love cod liver. I, I didn't know that like cod liver was a thing, but you were talking about cod liver oil. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I wonder, like, I was like, it must be like literal, like cod liver. Yeah. So I was like, and that's just on Amazon. I searched on the internet and I found that on Amazon. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's like, I mean, you could almost like spread it on toast. It's like butter. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I know. It's like uh foie gras or whatever that stuff is. <laughs> right? It's like, yeah. A little less, a little more humane. Yeah, exactly. I'm uh, at Mark Smelly Bell on social media. Uh, my brand is uh, I have Mark Bell Slingshot. If you want to check out any of those products, or if you want to check out my supplements, it's withinyourbrand.com. Right on, man. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it.